Hello and welcome to the first of a series of video presentations on one of the most exciting areas of development for embedded systems, Bluetooth Low Energy. Now, you, you might be wondering why anyone would name a technology low energy. After all, it kind of sounds like an insult. But if you're trying to squeeze every last bit of runtime from a battery, being low energy is a definite advantage. After all, when you choose a battery, you're trading size, weight, and cost for energy. If your application can use less energy, well, you can trim the size, shed a little weight, and save some cost. Low energy suddenly sounds like a very worthwhile goal. Now, before I tell you what Bluetooth low energy is, we should really cover what it isn't. First, understand that Bluetooth low energy wasn't originally Bluetooth at all. It was a wireless technology called Wibri. Wibri borrowed some Bluetooth techniques, including the channel scheme, GFSK modulation, and frequency hopping, and all this commonality made Wibri really easy to integrate alongside traditional Bluetooth. In 2007, the Bluetooth SIG accepted Wibri as a new low-energy extension to the Bluetooth specification, so you really can't think of BLE as just skinny Bluetooth. You also can't really think of it as a network protocol, per se, although Bluetooth Low Energy can be used in networking schemes. BLE is really just a way of getting data from one device to another in close proximity. And most devices don't expose IP addresses and don't send routable packets. BLE just doesn't have a lot of the characteristics that we think of as network protocols. Third, it's not really good for a lot of the things that one normally associates with regular Bluetooth. For example, it won't stream audio. It just doesn't have the bandwidth. And it's not really good for a data modem. Same story. But BLE really is something special, and here's what I mean. Even though BLE is based on concepts that were pioneered in traditional Bluetooth, it really is a completely new protocol. For one thing, it doesn't require a lot of setup, pairing, or other preliminaries that characterize normal Bluetooth. For the most part, you just turn on the BLE device and it starts working. That makes BLE great for things like beacons that just report the location of a device, and sensors that report the state of some physical quantity. Now, of course, you can associate one BLE device with another. It's ideal for keyboards and such that need to last for a long time on a battery. And the low power, low data rate nature of BLE makes it ideal for one other market segment, the Internet of Things. Now, we said before that BLE isn't a network protocol, but it's still helpful to consider its place alongside other protocols in the network stack. Now, that requires just a little elaboration. By now, you're familiar with the seven layer network model. At the bottom, is the physical layer, the layer that deals with talking and listening on the physical wire or over the air. At the top is the application layer that describes how the network data is generated and consumed by the application. In the middle are all the various bits that allow applications to work without caring too much about the underlying network infrastructure and that allow the wire interfaces or the radios to do their thing without worrying about how the data is going to be used by the application. Now, in modern networks, the top three layers often make up an aggregate application layer, establishing and tearing down a user session and concern over how data is presented to the application. Well, that's now just part of the application itself. Think about a web browser. It manages logging you into a website. That's a session layer task as well as running scripts that might decode data coming up from the stack and formatting user responses to pass down the stack, jobs that are usually handled by a presentation layer. Now, similarly, we often think of the network and transport layers as one big monolithic block labeled TCP IP. Now, while network engineers may sweat the differences, most of us just think of an IP stack and don't worry that it includes elements of the transport layer, like TCP and UDP, as well as the network layer where IP lives. Now, at the bottom of the stack is the physical layer and the link layer, and this is where BLE lives. 
But here's the thing. Most BLE applications don't actually talk to a network layer. They just pass the data directly to an application. You certainly can embed the output of the network layer down to a BLE link or feed the output of the BLE link layer up to a network layer. It's just that that's not how it's usually done. See, that's why I said that BLE isn't really a network protocol. It's just a way to get information moved between two things that are in close proximity. Now, since Bluetooth Low Energy is primarily a protocol concerned with a link and physical layers, we really ought to take a look at them more closely. First, the physical layer. In an RF system, the physical layer tells the designer what frequencies the system uses, and what modulation techniques the transmitter should use, and what the receiver ought to listen for. When the transmitter can operate, what power levels the transmitter should emit. In short, the physical layer rules define how the radio transceiver operates without regard to the contents of the transmission. It's the link layer that worries about making data ready for the transmitter and unpacking received data to make it ready to hand off to the application. It describes what constitutes a device address, how to discover other devices on the network. It defines a packet and how the fields within the packet are formatted. Frequently, the link layer will define some kind of error handling and may include data redundancy. So. Here's where we're going to leave it today. Bluetooth Low Energy is a radio frequency protocol that uses many of the principles embodied in Bluetooth. But it's much better than traditional Bluetooth for transferring small data packets to and from battery operated nodes. Now, in our next installment, we're going to zero in on the radio and we'll see what makes BLE unique. See you then.